So we're going to go to the topic that Jim Fetzer and I argued about a little bit ago on Truth uh, on False Flag Weekly News, and that is the topic of Planned Parenthood, birth control, uh, family issues, and religion, or lack of it. Jim Fetzer is a secular humanist, uh, an agnostic. I'm a Muslim, and we've got E. Michael Jones, an extremely eloquent and erudite Catholic. Uh, so we've got a, a secular humanist, a Muslim, and a Catholic walk into a radio show and talk about birth control. Should be fun. Let's get going here. Uh, we're going to each person take five minutes and do a round robin. So let's start with Jim Fetzer. Jim, give us your take on family planning and, and Planned Parenthood. Well, I want to begin by addressing the broader issue of abortion and birth control and related issues, but I must say I'm delighted to be here with you and Mike. I think this was an excellent idea. Just to define my stance as a professional philosopher and agnostic, as you observe, who recognizes that ex the existence of God and the non-existence of God are both not amenable to proof, or I'm looking for scientific evidence uh, to support my positions, I endorse a principle known as the ethics of belief, first advanced by the British philosopher William Clifford in 1879, according to which we're morally entitled to hold a belief only when we are logically entitled to hold that belief. This principle sounds simple, but its effects can be profound. An alternative approach known as the will to believe, William James, 1897, holds that in some cases a belief may be worthy of acceptance, even if there is no empirical evidence in its support, especially when the causal consequences of adopting that belief are beneficial. Belief in God might then be said to be justified because it makes a contribution to morality. The enormous differences in belief represented by the world's religions, however, not to mention the diverse sects and creeds of varied faiths, <clears throat> suggest that the will to believe can take many and varied forms. It does not appear promising for resolving conflicts between members of diverse faiths. The ethics of belief, by contrast, appears to be a principle that promotes democracy and conflict resolution. Abortion, after all, is the law of the land, which means those who are actively interfering with a woman's right are violating the law. The Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade, 1973, divided the cycle of gestation into trimesters, three three-month-long intervals. The court decided that the state had no compelling rationale for interfering with the performance of abortions during the first three months of gestation, when they are unrestrictedly permissible but that it had an interest in protecting women in relation to their performance during the second, when how they were to be conducted could be subject to regulation. In relation to the third trimester, the court held that abortions were permissible, but only to preserve the life or the health of the woman. Conservatives have bridled at this ruling, claiming that abortion should be permissible, but only in the case of rape, incest, or to save the life of the mother, and for no other reasons. Some deny even those circumstances. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of the court's ruling was a division into trimesters, which can be correlated at least approximately with the development of the fetus, such as that heart function has been established and brain activity is detectable by the end of the first trimester. Brain function has been established and viability attained by the end of the second where viability entails the capacity of the fetus to exist, to live out of the uterine <clears throat> environment, and a live birth typically occurs at the end of the third trimester. Thus, although the court preserved the concept of personhood for the issue of live births, it could be argued that it was imposing a graduated scale of personhood for which the earliest stage occurs at the end of the second trimester where the entity first deserves to be treated as of a kind capable of having interests that require due consideration. It could be argued that at this stage only there are considerations in favor of a right to life of the fetus, provided it does not conflict with a woman's right to preserve her health and her life should a tension develop between them. The strongest inference that could be drawn from Roe v. Wade would appear to be that a person is a human fetus that has attained the status of viability, and that indeed appears to be a responsible position to adopt. Certainly, it represents a vastly better reasoned approach 
than to assume that zygotes and embryos are persons. Legal rights and responsibilities, after all, are distributed attendant upon attaining certain standing in the community, often as a function of a person's age. In most states, a person can obtain a driver's license at age 15, can marry without their parents' consent at age 18, and can vote in political elections at age 21. Their governments assume corresponding duties and obligations to protect those rights. This graduated theory of rights and responsibilities is pervasive in human society. No one would argue that infants or children should be able to drive, to marry, or to vote, which supports the conception of graduated rights that are contingent upon reaching certain stages of development, where the right to life of a fetus is only the first in a series of rights that increase with stages of development. And what if zygotes or embryos were persons? Governments with, at very least, possess obligations to ensure their right to life by such intrusive measures as, for example, mandatory monthly pregnancy testing, tracking the distribution of semen, monitoring sexual intercourse, promoting the adoption of unwanted zygotes and embryos, and otherwise enforcing their legal rights. The situation would be absurd. Okay, Mike, I guess it's your turn. Yes, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk on this important subject. Uh, first of all, uh, I think it's good to enter this discussion uh, as a discussion of Planned Parenthood because Planned Parenthood certainly preceded all of the Supreme Court decisions that you can talk about in this regard. In the course of my uh, life as a researcher and historian, it's become perfectly obvious to me that the Supreme Court initiates nothing in this country. What the Supreme Court does is ratify the uh, social engineering schemes of the elites because they are the part of that elite group of people. And so what you had here with Roe versus Wade in 1973 was simply a ratification of elite schemes uh, that can be best typified by Planned Parenthood. What were these elite schemes? They were basically population control, uh, eugenics. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. Margaret Sanger got involved in this, in these schemes, working for the elites, working for the Rockefeller family uh, during the 1920s. By, 1930, by the 1930s, this group of people who were concerned, this is, who, who are we talking about here? The Rockefellers represented what has come to be known as the WASP, the ruling class, the WASP elite. The WASP elite, over this period of time, uh, over the course of the 1920s, became concerned about something they called basically differential fertility. Differential fertility means basically that this group of people had adopted birth control as part of their social uh, program. And as soon as they did this, they became aware that other people had not adopted this program. Uh, it's mentioned in uh, Great Gatsby, if you remember that novel, where Tom Buchanan is concerned about the colored races taking over. This was the obsession of the WASP ruling class elite during this time. This is why they hired people like Margaret Sanger, who then went out and created her organization, Birth Control League, and le which later became uh, Planned Parenthood, basically to uh, police differential fertility for the ruling class elites, namely the, uh, of whom the Rockefellers were the primary family. This group had... Uh, achieved enough uh, standing by the 1930s that Margaret Sanger went before the Congress and pleaded with them uh, to uh, fund, to have tax-funded birth control. She went up against Monsignor John Ryan, representative of the Catholic Welfare Conference, and Ryan defeated Sanger in battle at that moment. Uh, during the 1930s, the government refused to get involved in birth control. They just simply would not accept Margaret Sanger's argument uh, that somehow the depression could be ameliorated by birth control. Uh, 
This is precisely what she tried to do. She was precisely working for the interest of the ruling class capitalist elite. Uh, her purpose was to basically uh, curb fertility among Catholics and Negroes and uh, also to drive down, keep wages low, uh, give people the illusion that somehow their poverty was the result of having children. As I said, this was defeated. Uh, this measure was defeated in the 1930s, largely because the Catholic Church was strong and united. Uh, undeterred by this, Margaret Sanger in the 40s went on to create the Negro Project. Polite people don't like to talk about the Negro Project anymore because it shows the racist underpinning of Planned Parenthood. But this is essentially what she was involved in. The culmination of all this came in 1965 when uh, the Catholic Church, in effect, collapsed as a social force in the United States with the, uh, the destruction of the, uh, the uh, uh, production code in Hollywood. The Jews then uh, cre uh, gained enormous political power uh, by eliminating the Catholics, and the WASP had their victory uh, in 1965 with Griswold versus Connecticut, which was the Supreme Court decision allowing uh, the sale of contraceptives. This was the beginning of the totalitarian state that we live in today, because these people were smart enough to understand that if you control sexuality, you control human life in general. The culmination of all this is, of course, the gay marriage decision, which just uh, was handed down also by the Supreme Court. In each instance, the Supreme Court is, is paid to come up with this mumbo jumbo about trimesters and all this other esoteric stuff that is completely beside the point. That's what they're paid to do, to come up with some type of quasi-legal justification for a fait accompli. And the fait accompli here was the WASP elite uh, uh, converting to birth control and then making an alliance with the Jews who were the people who gave us abortion. That's how we got to where we are today. We just had an instance of how this works in Indiana where, uh, the, the, uh, law, uh, the uh, legislature passed a Religious Freedom Restoration Act to protect people after 50 years of losing the culture wars. They're trying to back off so that mom and pop bakeries don't have to do uh, cakes for gay weddings. This was overturned by a cabal of CEOs and now the avant-garde, the current avant-garde of the sexual revolution, namely the homosexuals. So we have the same story, beginning, middle, and end. Sexual liberation is always a form of control. And in this instance, it's uh, the homosexual movement is now a form of overturning majority rule and imposing the rule of the minority on the majority. This is what happened in Indiana. This is the purpose of this. This is the purpose of all these elite schemes. Nothing has changed. Okay, well, those are two very different takes on the issue. And, you know, I, I'm going to back up and talk about what are we grounding our views of this matter on? You know, what's, what's the source of the judgments that we make? And in, in Islam, the uh, sources are quite different uh, from Jim's. Jim is grounding his arguments in the work of late 19th century philosophers. Uh, Mike, I believe, is grounding his, although he didn't say so expressly, in the message of a savior from 2,000 years ago as interpreted by uh, a, an organization known as the Catholic Church, and the head of that organization being the Pope. Uh, and, of course, both Jim and Mike are using rational empirical methods as well. So uh, I, I'm grounding my argument in the uh, revelations that have come to humanity. Divine revelations are, it's, I'm not preferring necessarily one over another, uh, that's really the, the most important part of the Islamic message is that there have been many divine revelations to many different peoples. And the best preserved of them and the culmination of them, the one that kind of sets them all straight, is, is the revelation that came to Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him. Uh, and yet that doesn't completely obviate all the others. And it doesn't 
relinquish us from our duty to use uh, rational empirical methods as well. Uh, so when I'm thinking about uh, issues of birth control, family planning, abortion, and so on, uh, I am thinking about the kinds of core ethical principles and values that have been revealed through the revelations, uh, including the revelation from uh, Jesus, peace upon him, as well as from Mohammed. And the uh, the grounding here would be a, a kind of a, an argument that, that human nature has been recognized properly in these revelations. One of the reasons that I accepted Islam was that I, I studied it and found that in virtually every area I could find, the core principles of Islam made sense in terms of my understanding of human nature, uh, rational, empirical, and indeed intuitive. Uh, for example, the Quran tells women to breastfeed for the full two-year term, unless it's a hardship. Uh, and that actually is, is, has been shown by science to be, and, and of course, normal human experience, which is empirical, uh, to be about, about right. The children do much, much better if they're breastfed, and two years is a pretty good uh, ballpark estimate for how long you should do that. Uh, likewise, the Islamic view of the importance of the family, of central nature of the family in social life, uh, has been proven by anthropology. And in culture after culture after culture that's been studied, there have been there are plenty of, of variations in details, but the basic core of uh, human social organization is uh, based on the family. All traditional symbols are, uh, systems are tribal in that sense, meaning all based on family relationships. And the core of family relationships is the notion of marriage, that is uh, a socially and indeed divinely sanctioned relationship between a man and a woman or a man and women, or in a very few cases, about 2% of societies or less, uh, it's possible to have uh, a uh, woman and two or more men. <laughs> but the vast majority of cultures actually are polygamous, uh, and I think it's 90% are polygamous, 7% are monogamous and fewer than 3% are, are, are polyandrous. So uh, Islam actually gets all of this right and gives us that notion that sexuality is only permissible in a procreative marriage or a marriage relationship that's based on, on procreation. Nobody's going to run around and give you a fertility tests to find out if you're really procreative and therefore you're allowed to be married. That's not how it works. But that's, that's, uh, basically human nature. And when sexuality gets outside of these bounds of what's licit, it tends to run wild in very unpleasant ways. We see this in virtually every war. We have mass rapes. Uh, we have general uh, taking advantage of women, if not out and out rape, happening in all sorts of situations outside of this divinely and socially sanctioned relationship of marriage. So Islam keeps sexuality within marriage, keeping the family as a basic unit of society. And all cultures have done something along these lines. Uh, and Islam gets it kind of right dead center anthropologically. Uh, so th this is the grounding that I, I used to look at what's going on today. And when I look at what's going on today, uh, my views are closer to Mike's than to Jim's because it looks to me that Mike is right, that we're in a very, very decadent phase of Western civilization when this family relationship is broken down, marriage, the marital relationship is broken down, most marriages now end in divorce, uh, most, huge numbers of children are being brought up by uh, single-parent families, uh, forms of sexuality that have been taboo in most societies are now running rampant in the public sphere. Uh, this is classic uh, civilizational decadence and breakdown. To me, it's it's fairly obvious. You don't have to read uh, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire to uh, to understand this, and you don't have to go into parts of uh, American cities that have had family breakdown since the 60s to see the results of them. So using both divine revelation uh, and, and intuition, which is a part of, of uh, reason in its classical understanding, I would, would argue that uh, Jim's willingness to go with a purely um, uh, rational empirical approach based on 19th century philosophy has given us a world 
that is heading in the wrong direction, that's already suffered all sorts of damage, it's only continuing to exist because it's able to rampage through the resources that we've been blessed with. Uh, but as those run out, as we run into environmental limits and so on, this is going to totally collapse. This is not a viable social model, uh, regardless of what the Supreme Court or what these 19th century philosophers may have said. Kevin, very good. I think that uh, we would all agree that eugenics and population control, the idea of massive reduction of the human population is a bad thing, and we aren't endorsing it as opposed to family planning, which I regard as a good thing, uh, which Planned Parenthood is supporting. It seems to me to be a basic right of women to have control of their bearing of children, my views aren't based on 19th century philosophy, but on scientific and empirical research and conceptual clarification, but is rooted in the principle of the ethics of belief, according to which uh, none of us is entitled to hold a belief that is not logically justifiable. The politicalization of religion together with advances in technology has put issues of abortion and stem cell research front and center in the political arena. Pro-life groups, for example, oppose stem cell research that has the greatest potential to deal with some of the most debilitating of human problems, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson, diabetes, and other inherited diseases. The importance of this research has recently been, infer, been uh, reaffirmed by UW-Madison, among other institutions. Opposition that's based on the belief that life begins at conception is not only mistaken, since the issue is the onset of personhood and not whether life begins at conception, but given the ethics of belief is not even moral. If we are to regain control of scientific research and its enormous potential to enhance the quality of life, and we must restrict the influence of religious beliefs on public policy debates. There are some promising signs, happily, as universities seek private funding to pursue stem cell research, which also deserves public funding and which benefits blacks and black families as well as whites and white families. The mix of religion with politics and science can produce indefensible outcomes. The stem cell debate, after all, verges on the absurd insofar as the overwhelming majority of the embryos used for harvesting cells would otherwise be discarded. Does a Christian right or, or Muslims or Catholics or Jews serious believe, seriously believe that it makes more sense from either a logical or a moral point of view to simply discard these cells rather than use them for the potential benefit of human beings? This appears to be one more example where ideology overrides sensibility and irrational beliefs improperly affect public policy. The right of a latter term fetus, of course, is not absolute, but relative to the rights of its mother. When those rights conflict, those of the mother as an adult whose rights outweigh those of the fetus are properly given precedence. Hence, a late term fetus has a right to life that can be overridden by risk to health and life of its parent. Women who are entitled to control their bodies, which is a very basic right, are therefore well advised to avoid sex with men who do not respect them. Before a woman engages in sex with a man, she should gain his acknowledgement that she has the right to decide what should be done in the case of an unplanned pregnancy. In the absence of that assurance, the best policy would seem to be just say no. Here is a summary of my stance. Morality, as I understand it, is predicated upon the principle of always treating other persons with respect and never merely as means. Anti-abortion zealots who are promoting ever more restrictions on women's reproductive rights are, in my view, immoral, anti-democratic, and un-American. They are immoral because slavery is immoral, if any acts are immoral. These fanatics want to convert women into reproductive slaves. Forcing a woman to bring to term an unwanted fetus is about as immoral as it gets. They are undemocratic because democracy is based upon freedom of choice, which has historically been the basis for our government. In this case, these zealots are imposing articles of faith upon others who do not share them. 
They are un-American, finally, because as a constitutional republic, this nation is supposed to be governed by the rule of law, not the interests of religious fanatics who are doing everything they can to subvert the law of the land. Well, what, what you see here is uh, exactly the technique that I described uh, when the homosexuals and the CEOs uh, got together to overturn the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in Indiana. Uh, what, what Jim's doing here is basically demonizing anyone who has uh, religious beliefs, and the next step after demonizing them is then to disenfranchise them. So basically what he's saying here is that anyone who has religious beliefs should not have any say in the laws, uh, making the laws of the United States or any uh, type of uh, significant debate in the United States of America. Now, uh, how you can defend this and still claim that you're being democratic is a mystery to me, but that's what that's what these people do. That's what the sexual liberation movement has been from its inception. It is always some type of minority trying to impose its views on the majority of the people. The homosexual movement is only the most obvious and most recent example of this. It's been going on for decades now. Why do you think that the Supreme Court had to pass this, had to pass this ruling? It had to pass this ruling, uh, uh, whether it's Griswold versus Connecticut or uh, the contraception ruling or the certainly Roe versus Wade or Obergefell, because the overwhelming majority of the American people disagree with it. They disagree with it. There's no way you can get around that. And so they just short circuit the whole democratic process and send hand down some mucus from nine men uh, or women or whoever uh, on the Supreme Court. And now that's the so-called law of the land. Well, I'm sorry, but we know how it works now. We we just we're not stupid. We know that this is simply a, a group of people who are trying to disenfranchise the majority. And the question then is, well, why are they the majority? Well, because their position is the reasonable position. And we have to get down to brass tacks here and say, ultimately, the atheist position and the agnostic position is irrational. It is irrational because the existence of God can be known by reason alone. Okay? We don't need a law or we don't need Jesus Christ to tell us what is right and wrong, although they certainly do do that. And Moses did it too, okay? But these are simply reinforcements of the nature of a human being who is a rational creature. And as a rational creature, he must make decisions about how he's going to act. Man does not have sex the way salmon have sex. Salmon have uh, chemical reactions going off, and they start swimming upstream, and that's that. Man has to choose. He chooses. He makes choices. And he has to make choices according to what he considers is good. Okay? This is the basis of what we're talking about. And so if you can explain to me how it's good, how you can generalize from, uh, you mentioned stem cell research. Let's talk about Planned Parenthood and body parts. Why not deal with that? People will benefit from these body parts. Planned Parenthood is willing to sell you body parts and you can benefit from them. But anyone who has a minimal amount of moral consciousness, which is another word for practical reason, knows it's wrong. It's wrong to sacrifice someone's life to your convenience. That's morally wrong, and every single human being on the planet knows that. And that's the majority, and that's why the majority opposes abortion. Okay, we can go from there to the majority also. Whenever the majority was given a choice in the United States of America, they they voted and said that marriage was between a man and a woman. This is obvious. This is obvious to any rational creature. And when it's so obvious, what we need are uh, money-funded elites who volunteer to do the bidding of the capitalist ruling class 
and impose minority rule on everyone else. This is what Margaret Sanger did. This is what the homosexuals are doing now. This is what this whole sexual liberation movement is, in a nutshell, beginning, middle, and end. As I said, it's all elites volunteering for personal gain to do the bidding of the capitalist ruling class because the capitalist ruling class has certain imperatives that they need to fulfill. When it was the WASP ruling class, they didn't like Negroes and Catholics having all those children. Now that they won that battle, it's a question of destroying the entire family. In the 70s, uh, feminism was created to basically con to put women into the workforce because if you double the workforce, you drive down wages. In every single instance we're talking about, it is always the rational majority, the people who understand what is right and wrong, being overridden by a tiny minority of people who are being funded by the capitalist elite. Okay. Well, let's hear, hear, Mike. <laughs> uh, so I, I would have to uh, agree with a lot of that. Um, and I agree also that, that Jim uh, does seem to be either, you know, so demonizing and or disenfranchising religious people by saying that religious views can't be involved in public policy. Therefore, anyone with religious views obviously cannot participate in public policy because obviously they cannot get rid of their religious views. Uh, and that seems very questionable. I think that is a symptom of the kind of new world order elite uh, social engineering project that Mike is talking about. I agree that there is, in fact, such a project. I would go one step further and argue that there has been a, a Freemasonic-led effort since at least the late 18th century to engineer a new world order, meaning the first, that is a new order, the first one in which religion is not the basis of society. It was also a new world order in the sense that it would be new, the first one to embrace the entire world. It'll be a world dictatorship with everybody microchipped. And it's the new world order in the sense that it's going to be based in the new world, specifically in Washington, D.C., which is one giant maze of Freemasonic symbols. So I, I agree with Mike that there is this uh, social engineering project, but it's even worse than he thinks. The, these New World Order people are, in fact, religious. They are overthrowing traditional religion, but they themselves are Satanists, or as David Dionysi calls them, they are the Brotherhood of Death. Uh, they, are, they worship human sacrifice and big lies. These are the people who did 9-11 and who did many of the other crimes that I talk about on this radio show and that Jim talks about on his various shows as well. So I think that uh, religious people are, in fact, the vanguard of resistance against this New World Order project. And the idea of having uh, a society without any religious input uh, is radical, revolutionary, and ultimately ridiculous because people are, are religious. Of course, the word religious can be endlessly debated, but uh, I would say that it, it always ends up in in arguing that there's a, a very important source of ultimate values that transcend the values of this world that we you know, we are open to. We can get it through practical reason and moral consciousness directly, intuitively, as Mike suggests, but we can also get it through uh, traditions of revelation. And all societies have these things because you can't ground social life on merely uh, this world information. Uh, this is, is, is it, you know, it's, it's obvious for Jim. It doesn't seem like right. Jim is a basically a decent person and he doesn't see that that decency is coming from a transcendental transcendental source, but using simply logic stripped of this moral intuition, there's no reason why it wouldn't be okay to let's say uh, eat babies as Jonathan Swift proposed in, in a modest proposal uh, there's no reason why it wouldn't be okay to bury female children alive, the practice of infanticide that was extremely common before Islam banned it. Uh, and there would indeed be no reason to say that, for example, peace is any better than war, that raping, pillaging, and killing people in a frenzy, an orgi orgiastic frenzy of, of abandonment might be the most fun thing there is, right? I mean, for some people it probably is, certainly the most exciting. Uh, and there's really no purely logical or rational argument against this uh, unless it's grounded in some kind of moral postulate. 
And the, where do these moral postulates come from? Well, Jim just accepts a whole lot of moral postulates because he's he's got that, that divinely guided intuition, I would argue. But he thinks he's just arguing rationally. But no, we could have a Satanist or a uh, you know, a pure hedonist or a psychopath, even a very a rational psychopath could be here arguing with us using the very kind of, of forms of argument that Jim is defending is the only possible uh, legitimate forms. And that person could defend all of these things that Jim would consider bad. The source of judgment of what's good and bad actually has to come from some sort of transcendental source or what we might call at the very least intuition. And I think that needs to be acknowledged. That's why we need uh, religion in our social policy debates, because religion is the institutional memory of that uh, moral grounding, uh, that that moral intuition, or moral consciousness, or what Mike calls it practical reason. That's how it gets codified and uh, enshrined and passed down from generation to generation. So if I were going to be undemocratic, I would say let's ban non-religious people from public policy. But that would be stupid, too, because there are non-religious people like Jim who have actually very good moral intuitions and make uh, gener and good arguments in most cases. In this particular case, though, I don't think so. But let's hear, hear how Jim responds. Go ahead, Jim. Well, of course, I wouldn't deign to suggest you or Mike as a religious fanatic. That was not my point, but that religious beliefs which violate the ethics of belief are not proper foundation for making decisions about public policy and the laws of the land. Personal beliefs are one thing, but imposing them upon others is another matter entirely. We have to respect the right of everyone to their personal beliefs, but not to dictate public policy. I'm afraid you don't understand my commitment to deontological moral theory of always treating other persons uh, with respect and never merely as means, which would preclude a, a host of horrors you are attributing to me, which is embedded in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, that very deontological conception of always treating other persons with respect and never merely as means. Do zygotes, embryos, and fetuses qualify as persons in the sense of social and moral entities that can have interests and that have to be treated with respect? Are they persons as entities with interests that are entitled to due consideration? Given the ethics of belief, this question cannot properly be answered based on articles of faith. Even if the Roman Catholic Church, for example, maintains the doctrine of ensoulment, that the soul enters the body at conception, this does not qualify as an acceptable solution to the problem. The presence or absence of souls is not accessible directly or indirectly to observation, measurement, or experiment and cannot satisfy the conditions of logical entitlement on the basis of inductive or deductive reasoning. Three possible sources of information that might matter to answering this question, however, include ordinary language, embryology, and law, especially the Supreme Court's decision in Roe v. Wade. No unambiguous answer to the question appears to be derivable from the use of ordinary language. According to Webster's New World Dictionary, third college edition, 1988, for example, the term has a variety of senses, such as the following, person equals by definition, a human being, especially as distinguished from a thing or lower animal, individual, man, woman, child, a living human body, bodily form or appearance, to be neat about one's person, personality, self, being, in the law, any individual or incorporated group having certain legal rights and responsibilities in Christian theology, any of the three modes of being, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in the Trinity. Now, the notion of a living human body suggests that to be a person, an entity must have a separate existence which hints that even fetuses may not qualify under ordinary language criteria. Certainly, the notion of personality appears to be highly inappropriate for zygotes and embryos, especially though some women report behavior by their fetuses during later stages indicative of personalities. At best, the use of the word person in ordinary language appears to suggest that zygotes and embryos are only early stages in the development of persons. Nor can the problem be resolved by appealing to medical embryology. The stages of embryonic development, for example, proceed through the fertilized ovum to blastocytes and villus formation onto entities that resemble shrimp 
or seahorses far more than they do human beings, where morphological similarity is a standard for personhood, then there would be no basis for making such a claim prior to the seventh week or later. And surely that is what we should expect, since embryology is not a source of social and moral concepts, but rather the study of the various stages of human gestation. The prospect that zygotes and embryos are no more than early stages in the development of persons becomes important within the framework of the ethics of belief, because if they do not qualify as persons, then they are not the kind of entities that are capable of having interests that require due consideration. In that case, abortions are not murder, because they do not involve the deliberate killing of a person that is morally wrong. Indeed, this turns out to be the case on two grounds, since first, they are not persons at all, and second, they are not among the kinds of entities that it would be morally wrong to kill. It should be observed in passing that even the deliberate killing of persons is not always considered to be morally wrong, as examples of soldiers in combat, police and the performance of their duties, and civilians in self-defense display. The non-person alternative would seem to be to consider the developing entity is a special kind of property, which may appropriately be entitled to special forms of protection under the law. Yeah, this this reminds me of, uh, it's like deja vu all over again. Here, here we are back in 1973, and we're talking about persons. The only function of the word person here is to deprive a human being of his rights. Now, the Supreme Court has already shown that it's willing to do this with Negroes in the Dred Scott decision, so why shouldn't it do it with the fetus? There's no difference here. Personhood is a fiction that was created by the Supreme Court to justify murder. That's what it is. That's all it is. That's all it's ever been. It's all it's ever been with the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is totally willing anytime, any place to ratify the schemes of the rich and the powerful. That's why they're the Supreme Court. That's what's going on here. There's nothing else to talk about. Here we have the why. Why is the term personhood so important? Because it allows you as the more powerful actor to deprive the less powerful actor of his rights as a human being. If we're talking about it being anti-scientific, if there's one group that refuses to look into the telescope or the microscope when it comes to the development of the human being, it is the Supreme Court and the so-called scientific establishment that they have used as their uh, backup in this argument. The viability of the fetus was something that was touched on in these arguments. The viability of the fetus has gone down and down and down to the point where, uh, in my own personal experience, uh, I have a granddaughter uh, who weighed less than two pounds. Okay, She would not have been viable in any way, shape, or form, and yet because of technology, she's a perfectly normal functioning human being at this time. There is no dividing line here in nature. There is no dividing line between you, the person, as two cells when you began, when all of your DNA makeup was complete, and you, the person who's talking over Skype right now. There's no dividing line. It is a seamless garment. The only dividing line that you're, you're coming up with is one that was confected by the Supreme Court to justify murder. That's all we're talking about here. That's what a person is. That's the use of the term person. Well, the... the uh Islamic view on this is actually kind of in between. Uh, Islam is said to be the uh, religion of moderation. Uh, and here the scholarly view is that abortion is generally seen to be uh, at, at best uh, detestable, but there are occasionally mitigating circumstances. In Islam, it's not the trimester that gets cited. It's the uh, four-month period. Taking a life after the four-month period is considered absolutely the worst. Uh, and then there's sort of a graduated uh, degree of sins going back to the very earliest stage. 
when it's still detestable but not as bad. So basically, in Islam, the more the fetus develops, and the development of a fetus, by the way, is described in the Quran, which is believed by some to be a scientific miracle because that was not known to most people or to science at that time. Uh, this uh, development uh, does, in, in the classical Islamic view, indicate a kind of a coming into a kind of personhood that means that killing the person gets worse as you move from the fertilized egg to the uh, leech or blood clot, as it's described in, very accurately in the Quran, uh, up through the early stages of the, the fetus becoming more and more looking like what we would consider a person. Uh, so, the, but the, the general view, the, the important thing in Islam, though, would be not so much the degree of sin of killing the fetus and the fact that under certain circumstances, such as threat to the woman's life, and according to some scholars, rape, uh, abortion before that four-month period might be, uh, if not uh, fully acceptable, at least understandable, that sort of discussion. But I mean, the important discussion here, though, is, is more the, the issue of the the uh, family, the sacred sacred quality of the family, and the current sexual mores in today's West that are undermining it. Uh, that that situation, I think, is a, it constitutes an emergency. That is, we're we're living at a time when the basis of human society, the family, is falling apart. And some will say, well, that's good because people are just not having children anymore. The birth rates are collapsing, you know, down to 1.0 children per woman in Italy, uh, something getting close to that in Germany, and that this is all to the good because there are too many people anyway. Uh, as whether or not that might be true, the larger this this is not sustainable. You know, whether or not the population rate, uh, uh, replacement rate, is sustainable or not, the cultural model that we're living through right now obviously isn't sustainable we're seeing uh, and and we're we're seeing a development of technology uh, in all sorts of destructive ways ranging from weapons uh, including biological weapons uh, that are doomed destined to, to kill us all ultimately same thing with artificial intelligence artificial life and nanotechnology which are converging into something that is going to not only put us out of business, but we'll probably put all natural life out of business if it continues. Uh, we're, we're living in a profoundly unnatural world. I would argue that this is partly the result of a mistake in a certain strand of Christianity, which rejects the goodness of human nature and talks about uh, original sin in an exaggerated way. This has led to post-Christianity, which is what the situation we're in now, becoming uh, at, at war with nature, including human nature. And this war on human nature includes these uh, you know, sexual abominations that are all around us, uh, this destruction of the family, uh, which is the basis of, of human nature. And it's no coincidence that this destruction of, of the most basic element of human nature is happening at the same time that nature itself is being destroyed. The people ultimately behind this war on human nature and on nature itself these satanic New World Order demonic overlords, and I believe they're the ones who are the elite ultimately that's pushing the agenda that Mike's talking about, and it's a demonic agenda, quite literally, uh, are, are pushing not just humanity but the entire uh, biosphere towards complete uh, destruction. So I, I think it's, it's even worse than Mike thinks. Uh, but I'm sure you don't agree, Jim. Well, once we have cleared away the religious beliefs that tend to obfuscate the issues, it becomes apparent that the normative notion of personhood as a social, legal, moral concept needs to be suitably correlated with descriptive personhood as a scientific, empirical, testable property. We need a criterion such as viability as a generally reliable but not therefore infallible standard. The deontological theory of morality, moreover, at the minimum implies the harm principle, namely, that it is morally wrong to inflict physical harm upon persons in the absence of their consent, which typically implies the presence of sentience or consciousness, ordinarily the existence of the capacity to experience pain. Sentience would therefore appear to provide an alternative to viability as a preferable conception of the earliest stages of personhood. But where, remarkably enough, the onset of sentience occurs, appears to occur at the end of the second trimester, uh, coincident with viability. The conception of graduated rights that accrue at different stages in the life of a person supports the inference that 
prior to viability. An entity that could develop into a human being has no right to life, especially in a conflict with those of the woman who bears it. Sentience, however, understood as implying the capacity to experience pain, serves as a possibly more defensible alternative to viability for justifying the proportional ascription of conditional personhood to the developing fetus, for the fetus having attained the stage of sentience has a right to life, as long as it does not conflict with or adversely affect the life or health of its bearer. On either viability or sentience criteria, there appears to be an appropriate correlation between the normative conception of personhood and its descriptive counterparts. Here's a summation of my conclusions. First, we are not logically entitled to hold the belief that stem cells, zygotes, embryos, or early-term fetuses are persons on the basis of theological religious beliefs. Second, we are not logically entitled to hold the belief that abortion and stem cell research are immoral on the basis of theological religious beliefs. Third, we are not logically entitled to hold the belief that abortion and stem cell research are immoral on the basis of social, political, religious beliefs unless they can be shown to be immoral on the basis of deontological standards. Fourth, in order to be shown to be immoral on the basis of deontological standards, it would be necessary to show that stem cells, zygotes, embryos, and early-term fetuses properly qualify as persons in the moral sense. Five, neither ordinary language nor medical embryology nor the Supreme Court provides any logical entitlement to conclude that stem cells, zygotes, embryos, or early-term fetuses properly qualify as persons in the appropriate sense. Six, appeals to sentience and to viability appear to provide objective criteria that support the view that late-term fetuses may properly qualify as persons in the absence of stronger standards. Seven, consciousness and cognition or characteristics of the position of mentality appear to provide a stronger standard but although not elaborated here, it is one that supports and reinforces distinctions between early stage and late term fetuses. Eighth, moreover, there appears to be no other non-theological basis for qualifying early, qualifying early stage fetuses as person. Ninth, it follows that we are not logically justified in holding the belief that early term fetuses properly qualifies as persons. Tenth, since we are not logically entitled to that belief, therefore we are also not morally entitled to hold it. It follows that the slogan, abortion is murder, simply does not apply to taking the life of early term fetuses since they do not properly qualify as persons. If the alternative is to qualify them as special kinds of private property, even ones that deserve recognition under the law, that is another matter entirely. There are good reasons to treat the killing of a pregnant woman as an aggravated offense in those cases where it brings about the death of the fetus as well. Even though women may voluntarily choose abortions, that does not give anyone else the right to bring about the termination of their pregnancies. Indeed, since the treatment of early term fetuses as persons cannot be logically justified and thereby violates the ethics of belief, even religious persons who interfere with the right of others to abortions and stem cell research no matter how sincere their beliefs are moral, their lives in other respects are putting are pursuing immoral politics. And indeed, it is violations of the ethics of belief that appear to be creating the major obstacles for scientific research today. Okay, so Mike, uh, we if you could hold this one to maybe two and a half minutes or so. Uh, yeah. For, for, first of all, I'd like to say that it's. I thought this was a dialogue. This is not dialogue. I mean, what is, what is Jim Fetzer doing here? He's reading some type of boilerplate Planned Parenthood propaganda at, at both of us and totally ignoring what we said. I mean, if you had listened to what I had said, you wouldn't have said what you just said. There's no dialogue here. This is pure arrogant from uh, 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 condescension. There, we're not even engaging in discussion here. You're just reading something at me. You're ignoring what I said. You're reading something at me. And this is completely typical of the high-handed attitude that all these elites have toward not only religious people, but the majority of people on this planet. 
And this is totally destructive, any type of social cooperation or social fabric. And you people bear the responsibility for the destruction of the social fabric because of your high-handed, amoral attitude toward human life. This, is, this was an insult to both Kevin and me to, to have you read that at us without it engaging, without even making the attempt to engage in dialogue. Okay, well, maybe we'll have another show where we engage in dialogue then. I think that would be a good idea. Uh, I, there is something there about the monologue versus dialogue issue. My favorite literary philosopher, Bakhtin, made a, his life's work uh, around that issue. <laughs> and I, I think perhaps social policy is being set by people who are practitioners uh, of, of monologic discourse. And we'll, we'll have to chew on that one and then come back and maybe – take it from there in a, a more responsive format next time. If, uh, if, if I might squeeze a word in edgewise. Okay. Very edgewise. Don't, don't talk different. about e words everything, in edgewise everything I said when all you're my, doing is reading uh, a script at it. Shut don't up, Mike. Don't talk about that. This was shut an up. insult to both of us to Kevin, have, this to have you ridiculous. Like These that. That. issues are so complex. Don't give us that. You're just haranguing us from a pre-written This is reminding me of when I was on Hannity, you guys. This is all based on my research. I published two books that address these issues. Okay, okay, Jim, we're going to have to take this up at a future date, and maybe we can get more of a dialogue. Listen, I responded to your comments at the beginning of each of mine. Check it out. They're there. Okay, well, we'll go back, and listeners, you decide, were we having a real dialogue or not? And if not, how could we have a more dialogic conversation on these issues? I'm Kevin Barrett. This is Truth Jihad Radio with uh, Jim Fetzer and E. Michael.